in this show, you could win the Azure Primal Bowl 8 limited edition Dread Bowl Mega Bundle. Get a load of what's in this. You have a 32 page full color Azure Forest rule book, the mat, 15 cards, a special edition Dread Ball box, special edition uh, Azure Forest gaming pitch, 10 corporation, 10 marauders, referee, balls, game cards, dice, counters, plastic hex bases, roster pads, mantic points, uh, free plastic dozer giant, free season two rulebook, multiplayer ultimate arena, season three rulebook, 54 card ultimate deck, 34 ultimate counters, one plastic alpha simian, plastic barricade, plastic big mech, plastic nameless spawn, clear plastic trihexes, and a partridge in a pear tree. Are you done? Yes. I thought that was never going to end. <laughs> that is a huge bundle. Watch the show to find out how you win. and welcome to The Weekender. Hello everyone. Good morning everybody. Uh, we have a, a big show ahead of us. Uh, as you can see, we're sitting in front of our mostly finished um, Infinity table. We're going to be talking at length about this table in uh, tomorrow's Weekender XLBS. That's the extra long backstage version of this show uh, that we put out for our backstagers. It's like a whole other episode of this. Uh, Backstage is the way that the community supports Beasts of War. It's our subscription service. It covers, it has Backstage. It has a load of other shows like Hobby Lab and uh, Three Colors Up Painting Tips. And it helps us keep the lights burning, servers running, and everything ticking along. Right. Basically, without it, we'd be f <laughs> are, 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 we, are we really going to be that? Really? From the stage, <laughs> within one minute. Are, are we really going to be that mean? We're just going to show this to you, but you have to be a backstager to learn all about it. Yeah, because we have so much other stuff to talk about um, that, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. I'll give you one nugget. It's Plastycraft. <laughs> it's Plastcraft Games. Yeah, we will be talking about it at length over the coming weeks, but uh, we have a few experiments that we tried that we are delighted with. Absolutely delighted with. So if you're into your Infinity or you're into Dust Tactics and Dust Warfare especially, you might want to check out tomorrow's XLBS. Okay, let's get this show on the road. Before we get into it all, an interesting argument has erupted locally. Well, we do love to argue. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what, what, what's the content of the argument? Right, it's, um, this is going to be a little bit of a, a segment on, well, I'd say it's about 40k, but it's probably more about tournaments than it is uh, about 40k, okay? Okay. Um, it seems that we're having a, a local tournament, okay? And that local tournament is being based on the European Team Championship rule set. Okay. So the ETC have their own kind of tournament rules. Okay. Right, so this is a, a hard nuts tournament. What, what? No, I don't think it's, it, I wouldn't describe it as hard nuts. You know, it's um, the, the European Team Championships is an extraordinary competition. Mm. Um, you know, you have teams, not only from across Europe, but I, I think the USA send a team, you know, mm. teams from all over the world compete in it. But over the years, you know, it's been going for a long number of years now. Over mm. the years, they have tightened up the rules uh, the, just for that competition. Right. So something has erupted locally in the meta, and there's a big... Locally as in... Locally here within Ireland. Yeah, but where's this tournament? This tournament is taking place in Belfast in, in, a, in a couple of weeks' time. Oh, is this Nordicon? Yeah. Right. So uh, Nordicon's the event. Mm. 40K is one of the tournaments at yep. the event. Um, if, you're, if you're in Ireland, there's uh, a ton of other well, events. There's, there's Kings of War, there's Infinity, it. there's War Machine. There's a new game called Wraithborn um, that's being demoed at it. So there's... Hi, whoa, hang on. We saw that at Gen Con last year. I'm going to have to get up for a look at that. Wraithborn? 
I think it's Wraithborn. Mm. It's a steampunk game, if I remember right. No, this nope, is this is this is a else. fantasy game created locally. Ah, my um, bad. So it's. Um, I thought you were going to start listing a load of cons, and I'm sitting here thinking, what can I say? What can I say? It's funny. <laughs> and all I could think of was Baldicon. That's all I could think of. Baldicon. I've changed my head in a couple of days. Anyway, let me get to the point. So the point is that um, a guy was uh, gearing up to enter the competition. Mm. Okay, he's built an army. And he's built an army based on this. Okay. So Imperial this is Knights. the Imperial Knights book. Okay. Um, you would have thought that's a codex. You would think nothing wrong with that. Well, it says okay. it right there on the front cover. Warhammer 40k codex. Codex. Um, so at first glance, I would have looked at this and I said, well, yeah, it's a codex, so you can base an army on that. Um, he's bought his knights, he's painted his knights, mm -hmm. it's all ready to go, and he's told he can't compete. Wait, what? He can't use this. Okay, okay, what madness is this? It's not madness. Let's see the book for a sec. It's not madness. Um, firstly, I feel for the guy, right? right. But it's, it's one of those unusual situations, right? It, it, let, me, let me cover it from both sides, right? Okay. Firstly, uh, from the guy that's built the army. He's went to the hassle of buying the stuff. Mm -hmm. He's bought a codex. He's, he's built, built and painted built it. and painted it all. I'm sure it looks lovely, but even if it doesn't. So long as he likes it, that's what's important. But when you say he's built an army, has he built an army with, like, one of these at its heart? No, you, build, just... you build an army, you can have six of them in an army. Right. So you can. Uh, I, I believe you can have six, of the, six knights in an army. You'll correct me, as always. Rainbow, Rainbow Marines. Turns out they were in. Oh yeah! Traders. Turns out they do exactly. <laughs> of course. Uh, so he, he's built this army. He's then uh, been gearing up to enter the the forty k contest, mm -hmm. and then he's just in the last day or two received a notification from the tournament organizer saying, "Sorry, you can't enter armies uh, like that." And apparently, it wasn't in the rules until he entered his army, and then now. I might be wrong it, on that. But is this a local rules judgment or has this come from the main... It, I, no, it's a local tournament yeah. based on the ETC rules. There's no ETC involvement in this other than their rule set is being used. And that happens all around where the... I, I believe that in America that some of the tournaments will use the kind of the basic rule set that Adepticon use. It's a very common thing that w of the big players who do the big tournaments they release their rule sets mm -hmm. of how a tournament runs, yeah. and then local organizers will take that and use it. But it's nothing to do with the big guys. So this is nothing to do with the ETC. Right. However, he's been told he can't run it, okay? Now, the usual arguments uh, came up, okay? Firstly, you had your people saying, well, tough luck, that's the rules, suck it up. Mm. Secondly, you had the tournament organizers saying, you know, we're doing our best to balance the game. Uh, we feel that the game isn't balanced for competitive play. We have maybe like some, one of the guys who I'm trying to get on the show. I uh, haven't been able to get him on yet. He's shy. But Johnny, Johnny, this goes out to you. Johnny, I want you on the show so we're going to talk about this kind of stuff because I, I think it is fascinating and I want to talk more about it. So let me see if I can shame Johnny into agreeing to come <laughs> on to the show. Um, but Johnny has vast experience. Johnny has competed in tournaments all over the world. Okay. He's competed at the highest levels. And Johnny's take on this is simply that clearly the rules aren't, aren't made for competitive play. And, and even Games Workshop will admit that themselves, that they, they're not building these rules for competitive play, okay? What they're doing is they're building uh, a fun hobby. That mm -hmm. is their goal, that's their mission, and you can't fault them for that. So it leaves guys like Johnny and the people behind ETC and the, the organizer of this particular tournament to try and piece together something that would be considered fair, okay? okay. So they have to, to change and adjust stuff. Then you have your other arguments of people hopping in and saying, oh, well, you know, the rules are like that to stop he who hath the most money from being able to just buy his way to uh, victory. Buy wins, yeah. Mm. My point on this is, right, I don't understand. The models themselves aren't going to win a game. Okay. No, I, I, I looked quickly at the stat line there. There is nothing broken about them. Front armor 13, side 12, rear 11, I think I read. Well, do you know what? That, that's all very well you sitting there saying that. I'm going to take Johnny's word for it in this instance because 
Johnny's been competed in hundreds of tournaments. Okay? okay. So if if this is something that the, the likes of Johnny and whatnot's been involved in, mm. I don't take that lightly. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. there's clearly something wrong there. Mm. However, can I ask a question? Is, yeah. is Johnny saying it's broke, or is it Johnny who's built the army? No, Johnny's saying it, it, Johnny is saying it's broken. Okay. That there, there's that there's an issue that that's why the ruling is the way it is. But what I want to know is right, and the, the, I'm not taking sides in this one way or the other. But I have a curiosity in this thing, right? right. Surely, even competitive play should be about supporting people's hobby. Mm. And it, you can't, I can't understand how in competitive play they can rule out an entire codex, right? Yeah. So if, if it's broken, right? People talk about pay to win. Okay, the guy has maybe spent a lot of money buying the models for this army, right? Yes, but... But that shouldn't have any bearing on it. If there's a problem with it, mm. can you not change the stats? Or can you not take out the particular weapon or combo or, or something. why not simply create a... In other uh, words, tweak it, not ban it. Yes. Well, if, if you actually created it so that anyone playing that in the tournament started off with a disadvantage, you know, in points. Uh, like a... They would have to do very, very well, well to win. Justin, you a could be onto some... A handicap, a handicap system. A handicap system there. Yeah. A handicap system for what they think is broken. You know, it, so then they can come, play, have fun with their hobby, but it's, perhaps it's one, one yeah. big can of worms that opens up what gets handicapped and what doesn't. Well, it, you don't get much more competitive than golf, right? True. And golf tournaments, in order to level the playing field, um, well, I would imagine friendly golf tournaments, will base it off a handicap, okay? So that better, better players uh, have a handicap applied to them so is it to try and level the playing field for the, to give the incoming, an equal chance the incoming to players, okay? Um, I think of that is a fabulous idea. Well, why, you know, could that even be a simpler method um, of doing uh, of doing a, 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 an organised play mm. uh, in a competitive environment and base handicaps off two things: handicaps based on armies, yeah, and possibly even handicaps based on number of previous wins and things like that. Yeah, if you're or, tracking them. or your your general ranking. You know, this all yeah. this all hits on a nerve for me as to why I've never ever shown any interest in going down this so-called competitive sort of route. Is I just don't like the idea of trying to go to a tournament and someone telling me what my hobby should be. I think that that is the hardest part, and that's why I feel for the guy that went and built that army. Um, I think it's a little bit disgusting for anybody to turn around and say. Um, and the tournament organizers didn't explicitly say this, but some people in the comments kind of said this, you know, um, that you're buying your way to a win. Why should somebody that, could, that can afford to do this, this, and this have yeah, an advantage over them? Here's a question for you. How do they know he's just buying to win? How do, but how he's do not they know to that? Win. No, no, he, this is what I'm saying. How can they say, oh, he's just buying to win? He probably loves the look of the models and loves the army and loves how it plays. Yeah, but all of that is irrelevant. Is, is is my point here? You know, it should never ever come down to, um, you know, you passing judgment mm. on what somebody can afford mm. or what somebody can't afford. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you know, and you know, the the blame doesn't rest with Workshop either. You know, if Workshop do a big complicated kit, right, yeah. and that complicated kit um, does a lot of stuff in terms of the rules and things like mm -hmm. that. Complicated kits are going to cost money. And, pardon me, they're also going to put a, a premium on it because it is a big, complicated yeah. kit. I don't think, you know, I, I really detest it whenever I see this whole argument uh, because it's almost like I sometimes see some members of the community almost sit back and rub their hands and go, ha, 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 you spent your money on that, you're not allowed to use that. Um, a tight uh, you. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I think that's disgusting. You know, it's uh, like that guy is entitled to his hobby, right? Yeah. So surely there must be a way to. Uh, and and I'm no expert, and you know, and, uh, I know that the job of a tournament organizer is a really, really difficult thing. And whenever you're maybe a couple of weeks away from a tournament. 
Um, maybe the maybe the gut reaction is to just I'm sorry you, well, you just can't use that. It's well, a curveball flying at them and they're going what what do we do what do we do? Mm -hmm. The other question is is it only as a primary detachment that it's banned or can you take your secondary detachment? So maybe want to ask Johnny and find out. Yeah, it's um, I want to find out more about. Uh, about organized play, about tournament organizers. Uh, there's a couple of uh, tournament organizers that I know very well. Um, Johnny, I know pretty well. And, and like I said, Johnny, if you're watching this, somebody's hopefully pointed you to this. Please come on the show because I want to talk about this. Johnny, be good. Yeah, be good, Johnny. Uh, second is Owen, um, my mate Owen from Huddersfield Games, who does horrendous things to you, is also a very, very good tournament organizer. So maybe Owen fancies coming across. Uh, I know Owen's got some 40k events, some we might even get involved in in the near future. Mm. But I want to understand better these things because surely, surely that's going overboard just to say, no, you're not allowed to use that. Yeah, your fun is wrong. Get it out of here. Mm. Now on the topic of Imperial Knights, right? Um, before all of this erupted, yes. Okay, this just happens to be a happy coincidence. But before all of this erupted, um, I'm continuing my 40k uh, yep. work on the campaign, and um, uh, big thank you to everybody that has been in touch about uh, helping us with the painting. We've had tons of responses. I wasn't expecting that. Um, we're busy at the moment, just getting all this stuff in. I honestly didn't expect as many responses as, we, as we've as we got. So later next week, uh, I'll be getting back in touch. Um, and if I miss you, um, please get back in touch with me because it's just I've had so many contacts from so many different places. I've had PMs via B4, I've had stuff come in via Facebook, I've had stuff come in via email. It's sometimes difficult for me to, to keep track of it all. So, But I will be getting back in touch with some of you uh, uh, about that. But back to what I'm doing. Yep. I'm jumping around a little bit in my own hobby uh, for the build-up of what we're doing in 40K. Mm -hmm. And I had been working on Imperial Knights because... Yep. They are just really cool. Clearly, we have to get something like this into the campaign somewhere, mm -hmm. okay? So what I've picked up, I'll okay. give you that. There you go. And I will set this here for the moment. What I have picked up to begin that process oh. is one of these bad boys. Uh, uh, flip the box around so the front's showing. Oh, one of these bad boys even. I thought the other picture was better. <laughs> one of these bad boys. <laughs> so this is the Leviathan Crusader from yes. uh, Dreamforge Games. This is a beautiful kit. I don't have much experience of this. I remember we had brought it into the studio yeah, and Gav, did Gav an unboxing. Yeah, his in from the Kickstarter. Ah, is that what happened? Yes. Yeah. So that's why we have this one now. But I remember doing the unboxing, and if we look at some of the weapon options on the back here. Yep. Uh, the way the Kickstarter was, the more you put in, the more of the options and stuff you got, and they did a Chaos version as well. Are all these weapon options in the box? No, no, no. You'll get, uh, I think it's one of the hands and one of the Gatling guns. Oh, so there is a Gatling gun in it? Yeah, you yeah. do get your arms in the box. The Gatling gun, the barrels on it, is bigger than a Rhino. Really? It's huge. So and it actually you, spins when you build it. So how do you get the rest? you buy the rest as upgrade kits? Yeah, the other ones are upgrade kits. But right, well, I wanted to get a, a kind of a, a look in the thing uh, here to uh, see. Yeah, you'll have, you'll have a challenge <laughs> opening it because they do pack it very well. So it's... Um, we all know you love a tightly packed box. I do. I do. Thank you for that, Justin. Hey. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm just gonna grin. It's too early <laughs> in the morning for that, isn't it? So let me let me get that out. Okay. Hang on. I have to do my usual. That new box smell. That new box smell. Right. So first up, we have the base. The dinner plate. It is huge. <laughs> it is big, isn't it? So that's the I that's, that's the bigger base. than pretty much any other base that's used out there at the minute. Um, how does that base compare to the base that the the Imperial Knights go on? I need uh, to find I that out. I think they're so. on the the oval base. Are they on the oval base? I so I may need are. to. Well, I'll definitely need to swap out the base then if that, if that's yeah, the case. Yeah, but so that so. is even bigger than a war Let's machine uh, yeah. colossal base. That's very similar. So instructions in the box as well. Yep, all very clean, very clear. Yeah. Nice and 3D. No problems with that. So, yep. and I just want to get an idea of just how much is in it. Oh, Ooh. They've changed the packing on this. So let's see. So, so there's a foam component. Yeah. Justin, it has a screwdriver. Yes, this is a man's miniature. It's like the Drobo of. Justin, it has a bag of screws. It's a man's miniature. They're, they're packing it a bit like a Drobo experience. Yeah, <laughs> so it's a, that is really kind of nice there yeah, that it comes I think, with uh, foam. This is came out of its slot. It should sit uh -huh. like that. That's chest plate, a couple of joints, back of the chest. 
Okay, the I'll give you that. Big ass Oh my pads. god, oh, look yeah. at that! Yeah. Now that is a bunch of sprues. It's only half of it. Yeah. That and is a, a bunch of sprues. There's a few more bits in here. Do you know what it reminds me? It reminds me a bit of the Stompa, the Stompa kit. It's just as well that uh, we are recording this in front of a live studio audience tonight. Audience, can we hear you? Yay! Are give you us, building it? Give us a, <laughs> give us a whoop. Woo! We have John in the studio. John, what do you think of this? John is weeping right. in the corner. Just look at the size of the head of this bad boy. Do you know, when you hold it like that, I have an idea for what to do with the sprues. What? If we cut all the middle bits out and just keep the outer bits, it becomes like a scaffold. It comes like a scaffold for and a building. And you can put it around a building. See, yeah. his, his hobby That's lab cool. mind is going uh, as well there. I, so. right, I think this might actually be posable as well. So this is what I have been thinking about using uh, for my Imperial Knights. So uh, I'm trying this one out first, but I actually am planning on rolling out a couple of these, mm. okay? Um, now, why did I opt for this over the game's workshop kit? Um, primarily because it's bigger. And it's more individual and more cool. Well, I, d I don't want to say it's more cool. You know, that, that comes down to the eye of the beholder. Um, I saw a poll run um, mm -hmm. on the interweb um, where people were voting on whether they liked this kit better than the Imperial Knight kit. And the Imperial Knight kit does look stunning, I've got to say. And this one topped out the poll. Or, mm -hmm. but, but for me... But did they say why it topped out the poll? No. Was there, not, there was no categories There was no why. categories was just a, to say just why. It was just a, just a straight, which one yeah. do you think is cooler? Mm. But for me, I've got to say, I've opted for this because... The, the, having seen them side by side, yeah. the Imperial Knight and the Leviathan, the Leviathan is more bulky, yeah. it's heavily or more heavily armoured, yeah. and it's bigger. The other thing I would say is the, 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 the words, the design aesthetic for this sits better with your alternate minis for, say, your Imperial Navy team and things like that. Yes. Well, this... Uh, the, the Space Marine chapter, well, basically for the Imperial Guard, we are working on that at the moment, how the Imperial Guard are going to work. Mm -hmm. The Space Marines are going to be based on the Minotaurs. Yeah. Okay? And I quite liked this as some something kind of in between, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I've got a lot more reading to do on the whole Imperial Knights thing to try and, you know, piece together how it's going to fit into the narrative. But... Sometimes, sometimes you just got to pick a kit because you like the look of it and yeah. you want the challenge of, of putting it together. And this one for me, I think, is going to be, is going to be it. So yeah. I'm hoping to take a little bit of a break um, sometime in the next couple of weeks. And that is going to be my uh, holiday project. Uh -huh. is putting uh, one of these together because... <laughs> so you're going to sneak this into the suitcase. <laughs> All right, love, here we are. You want well, you go relax there yeah, with the kids. You, you take the kiddies off shopping. I, I'm just going to put my feet up. Yeah. And she comes back to the hotel room. She comes back and you uh, just hotel room. No, no, no. <laughs> Some chance. Uh, whenever I talk about a holiday, if myself and Andrea are lucky this year, we might get camping. Okay, so there ain't no hotel rooms, but I I do quite fancy sitting late in the evenings in my tent. Yeah. Um, I'll bring a hobby light with me. Yeah, and Andrea and the kiddies all lying. So sleeping. Andrea will unzip the tent, look at it. It's just you sitting back there covered in glue. People... So, so basically, you're all going to wake up with bits of sprue up your arse. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I feel more for the guys that are going to be walking past at the, the, the night, and all they're going to hear is the sound of clip, 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 and the the smell of super glue, <laughs> and they're going to think it's some kind of nail bar where people are getting their nails clipped and nail polish put on. <laughs> That, or you'll have a, a very polite policeman turning up and rapping on the tent flap going, what's going on in here? Yeah, it, so... It's, it's so big and buff, it doesn't really fit back in. So, guys, what do you think um, about that? You know, what, what, which model would you go for? I've clearly opted for this one this time. I'm not discounting the, the Imperial Knights. It might be something that I might look at that model again in the future, mm. but I just was weighing up the, the value. I like the big plates and stuff like that yeah, there. It, it's got a very... Uh, the medieval feel to it, just with My the preference is the Imperial Knight. Why is that? I don't like massive models. I like models that look like they could make it through on your gaming table. I just don't like massive ones. I know there's a couple of other shapes in here, for example. I just I just like the... I don't know. The, 
I like the sort of the, just the hunchy shoulder looking stuff on this. Yeah, they, they kind of look like hunchbacks. I mean, let me compare them. Oh, well, they're, they're very, they're very similar. Aren't they, they are very similar when you when you see it. So it's a. Uh, mm. You give me a good picture of that one. We'll hold it up side by side. Yeah, there, there, yeah. there. Nice big red one. So, give you know, the option. You know, when you look at them like that, it is hard. I prefer the feet on the Imperial. I, I, I prefer the Leviathan simply for one thing, the big ass minigun. I'm not going to say I'm going to pick it just because its feet look nice. Yeah. You, you don't happen to have a thing about feet or anything, I do, do you, Lloyd? Do you? <laughs> Some sort of mechanical foot fetish. <laughs> well, what do you guys uh, do? How about we do, cast a little vote? Um, you're going to post a comment on this video anyway, so why not post your comment below which one do you prefer, the Imperial Knight or... The Leviathan. The Leviathan. And you know what? Let's make this a little bit more scientific. Tell us why. What is it about one versus the other that you like? And then from that, you know, we can maybe get a better idea of the aesthetic. For me, I like it because it's bigger and I think it looks badder ass. Lloyd <laughs> likes the ass. feet. I like the mechanical <laughs> feet. I like big guns. Okay, we're going to take a very quick break. Uh, after the break, we're going to be talking about some of the stuff that's going on in the gaming world. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. And welcome back. Okay, so stay tuned because we've got a, an interview with Ronnie Renton coming up where we're talking about all things Mantic and Kickstarter and yeah, stuff. Yeah, so, so you've been trying to squeeze him for information. Yes, yes. We, we have some... We've spent a little bit of time from Ronnie, or time with Ronnie, yeah. and we've had, <laughs> we've had some crack this week yeah. with, with him. So we have a bunch of uh, content that we've filmed. Um, and yes, the Mega Demo game is coming soon. Yes, but uh, myself and Ronnie filmed one first. Yes, so we're going to put that one out first mm -hmm. um, about Dead Zone, and then myself and James N. Hewitt will yes. be unveiling. Yes, we, we shall be resurrecting the yes. game master Hewitt. We'll be, we'll be unveiling the game that we played. The, yes. the funny thing, though, about when Ronnie comes over yeah. It's I've missed this, right? When Ronnie comes, it's been James has been coming over and doing a lot of stuff with yep. us. Well, it's been nearly a year and a half to two years before, since we last had Ronnie on the show. But yep. when Ronnie comes in, he dismantles the set. Yes. For example, yes. all these boxes behind us, yeah, he'll start you can going rearranged. picking them out, looking through them. Oh, that's cool. really I interesting. Just that. Mm -hmm. I love his enthusiasm for looking at other people's products. Not, not because he's going to copy them or anything. But because he's genuinely, genuinely enthusiastic about he is a gamer. What, what's everyone up to? He is a gamer as well, though. And he's really excited about what he's up to. Yeah. Mm. And what Mantic's up to. Yeah. It's, and it, it's great to it's get that, that vibe enthusiasm. from him. And it's an honest enthusiasm. That's what I love as well. The, the, the beauty of this industry is that we are in an industry where bean counters don't rule. Okay? There's a ton of other industries and this one will end up there sometime in the future. But there's a ton of other industries where the bean counters rule the nest, yes. okay? It's not like that in this industry. And that's why, to be fair, uh, before I go to sleep at night, I'm pinching myself because I think the day has been a dream just mm. working in this industry. Um, and, and but you have people like John Stallard, yeah. all right? We go to talk to John Stallard at Warlord Games, right? And all John can talk about is the new models they're making, and he's <laughs> laughing and giggling about the expressions on their faces. He loves it. Yeah, and you have seen his gaming room. Yes. That's, it's a huge gaming room filled with every last toy you could want. It's, he, he just loves it. Ronnie's the same. Mm. You know, you, uh, you talk with Ronnie, and Ronnie's passion, it's not just about Mantic. Ronnie loves the industry and he has done for a long number of years. We've had the same experience with the Perrys. Yep. The, we were talking about it in backstage last week, but the Perrys are now out on their own, um, which I'm sure for those guys has been um, a big step. Mm. Do you want to know how many years they worked in Workshop? I think you said last week, 32? 37 years. 37? 37 years. Remember, they joined Workshop as teenagers. Oh, yeah. They were brought on whenever it was Steve Jackson and Ian Livingston. Yeah, yeah I so feel it was their uh, first job. I mm -hmm. feel young again. 
37 years. So they they started working for Workshop when I was one year old. Exactly. They started I working for Workshop a, a decade before I was born. I had mm -hmm. a birthday a couple of weeks ago when I turned 35 and I thought, oh, I'm so old. And then you said they've been working for 37 years. I go, yeah, I'm still young. <laughs> but um, aside, right, they've left. I'm very excited about it because the those guys have an incredible future ahead of them. You've right? seen what they've been able to produce whilst working along what side workshop. Mm -hmm. They've always had new minis coming. Imagine out. what they can do now working full, full time. time. And then of course the other thing they do is they produce the most beautiful fifty four millimeter models mm -hmm. for Peter Jackson. Ah. Yeah, Peter Jackson uh, Peter Jackson is a huge fan of the Perrys. Yeah. Right? And he employs them directly to make miniatures at 54 millimeter scale just for him. Oh, so cool. even if those guys decide that they're not gonna go full time into Perry miniatures, which yeah. I imagine they probably will, you could end up seeing those guys work for Weta Workshop. Isn't that, the, isn't that Peter Jackson's own special effects outfit and stuff I, like I that there? They just, I'm just so pleased to see them being given the, the scope to express themselves now. Yeah. Because look what, Rick Priestley's doing with Bolt Action Gates of Antares. Look what John Stallard has accomplished with Warlord Games, and now Rick is also a director in that. Look what Alessio has done since he's got out. Yeah, since he you had know, River Horse. Look what go. Ronnie Renton has done since he's got yep. out. You, you could uh, look what um, is it? It's Mike from uh, Mike McVeigh yep. is uh, and the 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 guys at the top of uh, Privateer Press. Yep. <laughs> It's just unbelievable what they can do when they when they get out and they just can see. While you're mentioning what they do, Ronnie said something when he was over as well, which excited me. We were talking about Mantic and what they were doing, and he said Mantic is a terrain company in so much as they also make miniatures, but they love making terrain kits now as mm. well. And I just thought that was great mm -hmm. because I always thought a lot of these companies are just very so focused on just making miniatures all the time mm. and to yeah. see his commitment to making great terrain kits to go with his games yeah so that you can actually see the world you're playing in just, to, just uh, great. ronnie is committed to basically warpath dead zone kings of war mm -hmm. becoming fully fledged full-on hobbies mm -hmm. you know and it's um and who can fault him for that you know and what the work that they've done on that terrain kit, the the, the battle zones terrain kit yeah. is extraordinary, and we'll, we'll be showing you more about that over the coming days and and weeks. And you and you get the and you get a really good vibe that that's not the only terrain that you're going to mm. see coming out of Mantic. Oh yeah, but you're absolutely right. That level of enthusiasm, you know, you do see it in video games from the likes of Cliffy B and some of the guys up at the, uh, the at the top end, but <laughs> Cliffy B, who's just come out of retirement, a two year retirement. <laughs> yeah, so it's a uh, but. We we have that in abundance in our industry, and it was a prime example of it. We did have to spend about half a day putting the set back together because Ronnie wrecked it. <laughs> I know. I want to see this. I want to see that. I went to make a cup of tea. I said, Ronnie, you want a cup of tea? He went, yep, yep. Two sugars, milk. Yep. I thought that's fine. I went out and I came back. Bloody boxes everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was left in the studio with him, and it was just me watching them. I was like, go mad. Hmm. Did you not stop him? No, I just let him tear away. <laughs> no, it was just me going right. Well, I, I'm I'm kind of a grunt in this company, so I, I don't want to be. Nay saying someone who's in as a guest. Uh huh. You should so, have just wrestled them to the bloody floor. What, what, what happened to me, Casa, Su Casa? But we all do it. We all walk into each other's hobby sort of rooms and spaces. And, and, and the first thing you do is you start them. going through their cells yeah. to see what they've got. Look Even whenever we have new stuff coming in for unboxings, I'll, I'll see a, an innocuous little brown box sitting. And I, mm. I'm just sitting there wondering until I can get my hands on it to open it. What's in there? What cool stuff has arrived? Yeah. Yeah, That's it's... why we have a rule, if you open it, you pack it away. If yeah. you open it, you unbox it. And then you pack it away. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we don't touch it. Right, I want to talk about some of the stuff that's going on in the industry, because in terms of passion, there's another man's passion um, I'd like to talk about, and that is Dave from Hawk War Games on mm. Drop Zone Commander. This month, they are going to be teasing the new faction for, uh, for Drop Zone Commander, a game that's very, very close to my heart. And that is the resistance. Now, the first couple of pictures have come out of it, but I want to talk about the resistance, okay? Yeah. For me, this is a very, very exciting new faction, okay? The whole story of Drop Zone Commander, we've been over it uh, multiple times. Yeah, is... well, we, we saw some of the, the human stuff uh, a while back on a weekend, or mm -hmm. remember Dave came across, he brought yeah, some yeah. of the minis across? It is now pretty much at the stage where it's now a 
fully fleshed out faction. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, stay tuned to these releases because I think these guys even have kind of helicopters. Ooh. Gimme, I know. Gimme, gimme. I know. I don't want to give it give anything away, but I can't help it. <laughs> so well, it's a... from the images that came out. I have one thing to say. Mm -hmm. Battle bosses! Battle bosses, how give me, awesome give me are they? The, the thing about it is, right, um, Dave has an incredible attention to detail. Mm. The guy's just not wise in the head, let's be honest, <laughs> right? <laughs> his, his, detail, his, his whole scope for detail is incredible. Um, the resistance are basically what is left of humanity on the planets, okay? So these... Remember, this is now, is it 100 years later? or 100 200 years, 100 yeah. or 200 years later. So these are kids that have grown up knowing only being hunted by the scourge, mm -hmm. okay? So, you know, and they're kit bashing and putting everything to, together. They're feral. They, 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 these are like the orcs of Drop Zone Commander, only they're not all... They're us. ...stompy and, you know, wah... They are what humanity would be if you were put in the situation where mm -hmm. you have faced nothing but war and being hunted your yes, entire the, life. There is no longer a civilized society. You mm -hmm. are fighting to live or die. Now, one of the things that, uh, that has re really kind of been um, exciting me about Drop Zone Commander in recent weeks is they brought on a new artist called Patrice. Um, specifically to have in-house um, in-house artistry on hand to allow them to really flesh out the whole um, I don't know the whole background the whole visuals and visualization uh, of the game and some of the pieces he's been creating have been absolutely stunning um, we talked about them in the we had a designer studio chat. Uh, yes, but we also we talked about them during uh, the event. We have a video, so we'll be able to bring up some of these artworks. But one artwork in particular, which I'm hoping comes up now, is one of a resistance fighter clutching a little girl mm. with one of the massive razor worms down in the basement, basically going to eat them. And it, what Patrice is really capturing it's fear, is the only way I can describe it. You know, you look at the, the artwork of 40K, for example, and it's all epic. It's a bit gung-ho. <laughs> but it's really epic, it's really gung-ho, and life means nothing in it, the 40K it's, universe. It's quite propaganda if it's Imperial stuff, because yeah. it's always the battle charge of the Imperial Guard. Uh, but life means absolutely nothing at all. Yeah. It's, um, uh, and the, but that's just, the, that's just the style of it. Mm. You're gonna love this. Lloyd, just turn around and look right there. Down, down. Oh, oh. <laughs> We've had a spider come on set. Don't kill him, that might be a money spider. <laughs> so It's yellow, uh, whatever it, does, it is. Does that mean it's poisonous? I don't know, I don't know, but I'm mildly arachnophobic. Keep it the hell away from me. Whoa. So, but Drop Zone Commander, in terms of their artwork, are capturing something that I think I think it's very special. Mm. There's a, they seem to be able to capture fear, terror. From the sound um, of it, you have, it looks like a very personal view into here, the world. Justin, mm. you swap seats with me and we'll get an idea of what they've captured. Yeah, we'll get an idea of what they've <laughs> captured. Uh, I have two words for you, there's a beat coming up here. <laughs> no. <laughs> Make sure that's properly beat. It will be. Right? I've already had to do you once this episode. So, oh wait, no, no, no. So. Um, anyway, the resistance is coming out. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Mm. Stay tuned for this, guys, because the, the, the resistance drop ships are just stunning. Um, they, they really are something extraordinary. And all the resistance vehicles, like the battle buses, and the, they have uh, kind the of like attack, attack trucks on the technicals. Yep. Underneath of these models, are, there are chassis, exhaust pipes, everything. Yeah. It, it's a... Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to it's see this range come together. Mm. But if you were feral, wouldn't it be really crap if there was only crap music left? Or if the, there was only crap vehicles the, left to no, modify, no, no, forget that. like a 7C1? Forget, forget vehicles, we've talked about that. What if the Scourge came down and destroyed all the good music shops and you're only left with, like, Maria, he... And that's what you grew up with. The Numa Numa <laughs> song. Numa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Numa Numa, 
Gangnam style. <laughs> Gangnam style. Yeah, you, can, uh, you can see where that's you know, going. Charging that's, into high on the Eurovision Song Contest top 20. They're mm. charging into battle in their boss, Justin, with Gangnam style. <sighs> There's been I, I have that in my head. No, this is a horrible image I do not want. That's a, that's a pointless segment there anyway. Uh. So it's a great way to bring the whole thing right down. Okay, in other news, Gen Con is coming up. Yep. We're starting to see the rollout of all the stuff that's going to be happening at Gen Con. Mm -hmm. Things I'm excited about, well, I'm excited about D&D 5th. I'm looking forward to that. I want to see what the Wizards of the Coast have come up with. Mm -hmm. um, Infinity are going to have some awesome stuff on show at Gen Con. Mm -hmm. That's part of the reason why we're working on this kind of stuff. Uh, but they have just shown off... What have they shown off? Pantasilea. Pantasilea. Um, this is their Gen Con special model, and it's a new version of the Pantasilea. Um, she's a lady on a bike. Yeah. But this time, she's on one of the bikes that looks very like the bikes that the Coom Riders are yeah, on. The, yeah, the new Coom Riders, those mm -hmm. big, long road hogs. I really <sighs> like it. I like it better than the original, to be honest. Absolutely it, stunning. It, it kind of looks like her on her day off. Well, it is, right? You know, because uh, some it's people were like commenting saying, well, um, you know, she's in one of them exotic poses and stuff. Yeah, th this is kind of more of the bootleggy kind of mm. type thing again, you know, where this is, this, is, uh, this is an exercise in them sculpting something extraordinary. It's beauty for beauty's sake. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think it's an absolutely stunning looking model. Lloyd, you're looking a bit blank. I'm going to pass you over the iPad so as you can see what we're talking about and cast your own. Yeah, I've seen it. I'm trying to remember what the first model looked like off the top it of the head. It was her on more of a, a sports bike. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, my, my and her pose on it was yeah, quite my, sexy as my well. My overriding mm -hmm. memory of it, it was, it was bloody good too. Yeah. It was. This one in particular is stunning. I like the new direction of the bikes. Yeah, I we've, love the artwork for this. We have done, uh, we've done a video that is a kind of a, f uh, it's a backstage video but it's put out as a, a kind of like a what is it, a free a free sample, um, where we've been looking at uh, specifically the the new art direction because the art direction has been changing in Corvus Belly, and in fact let's play a clip of it. Okay, in. Buenas noches from beautiful Granada. So I've managed to capture these two guys from Corvus Belly. I'm joined by Carlos and by Angel Geraldes. Um, guys, on the forums and around the web, we're noticing now, um, I, I want to call it like a, an evolution, an evolving of the, the Infinity Miniatures range. We're seeing the, the kind of the art direction um, changing now. Um, uh, can you tell us what's going on behind the scenes in that? And, or am I just imagining things? No, it's very subtle, but it's happening. I mean, um, recently we added and we turned our sculptures into 3D sculptures and we have more 3D sculptures. Uh, that, that was 2013, last yeah. year, okay. Uh, Fausto Gutierrez uh, was a 3D sculptor that was already working for us, but became part of the staff, okay. And he's a very proactive guy, he's very productive, he's very fast, and he knows lots of stuff about 3D. And also Javier Ureña, another 3D sculptor, got into the... Um, become a Corvus Belli sculptor and working more with us and with Fausto also and Jose Luis Roch uh, is turning now into a 3D sculptor. The thing with this sculpture is that it's a new medium for because uh, Jose Luis Roch for, for example is a traditional sculpture that is jumping now into 3D sculpting, yeah. a new medium, uh, different styles of sculpting so before allowing everyone to do their stuff, uh, Carlos Torres decided to really uh, put more effort in some particular miniatures to make the, those be the base for the upcoming miniatures. Yeah. Because so it created almost like a definitive standard to say yes. these are the standards that we're, we're going to to base everything else against. Yeah, the, the basic proportions of human and female anatomy and sizes uh -huh. for, for all, making all the sculptures respect those sizes. Okay, yes. That already happened with traditional 
sculpting, but 3D sculpting allows more control. Yeah. I want to see the rest of that. The link, uh, the link to it is is here below. Um, but make sure you go and watch it uh, very, very soon because in the next week or so, we're going to be taking that that video right back into backstage. But it is fascinating to talk to Carlos and Angel Geraldes specifically about how they're evolving the the whole yeah, art where, direction. Where the look of the world is going, mm. and it's it's stunning. Uh, the other thing is, uh, there's uh, there's news in terms of uh, they've got a cosplayer um, who's going to be on the Infinity set or on the in the, the Infinity stand? booth. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the lady's name, but uh, uh, is it Marie Claude Bernabas? It might be. It might be. Did you send me a link to her Facebook page recently? Yeah, I did. And I oh, no, 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 that, that that, that's, that's the blonde lady. Yeah, that's no, the no, one no. who always works with Soda Pop. Yeah, no, 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 not it, it's, it's not that lady. Because we were, we were talking no. about Facebook and mm. using yeah. Facebook and stuff at the time you sent me that, and I just replied, that's cheating. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's, uh, no, 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 it's not that lady. This is, this is a, uh, no, she another... She beautiful costumes too. This is another lady who makes, uh, who makes exceptional costumes as well, mm. so she's using it as an opportunity to try and promote what she does. Yeah, she'll um, offer work. On the stand, yeah, so... Of course, the usual thing erupted over, um, well, that's a booth babe. It's not a booth babe, it's a cosplayer. And I think any cosplayer would probably take uh, offense at being called a booth babe. Not because they have anything against booth babes, because, you know, booth babes do a service. They do whatever it is that they do to try and promote a game. But because they're not booth babes, they're cosplayers. And cosplay takes a hell of a lot of passion, yep. a huge, stu well, a stupendous amount of creativity, and a ton of skill. And it takes, takes courage, too. It does take courage. Yeah, we still have to figure out what cosplay you're wearing, because you did say you would. I have been learning about cosplay. Mm. Okay, I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant on this one, All because right. I'm a bit annoyed <laughs> about this. You know, I, I find it absolutely, you know, people are saying, oh, it's offensive to have a cosplay out of birth babe. Do you know what? I'm more offended by you mislabeling somebody like that, the, uh, I, I think that that's absolutely horrendous. You know, I didn't understand cosplay, right? right? I went to cosplay and struggled to see past the flesh, right? Yeah. It is a struggle. <laughs> you know what I've got to say? You know, no, you're no, looking no, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you see a lot of scantily clad individuals, men and women, all yep. right? And you're looking at it and you can be confused by it. But you know what? You've got to look past the flesh. Cosplay is not about the flesh. It's about the creativity, the passion. And the love of the fandom. And to recreate both the spirit and the look of a character. Mm -hmm. You know, so... And cosplay is becoming a, it's becoming a trade in its own right. Mm -hmm. You know, I, one of the things that kind of surprised me at the time, and this has been my journey into understanding cosplay, is that some of the cosplayers uh, that we met at FitZone, FitZone, <laughs> FitZone, yes. FitCon, fit, 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 fit FitCon, FitCon, fit no. right? Is it FitCon? Uh, yes, FitCon. Fit it's no, it's no, not. It's, it's FitZone. FitZone. <laughs> right. I love to troll. But some of the cosplayers there had business cards. Yeah. And they, they are basically professional cosplay okay yeah. now I see I use professional lightly because I'm sure the market for cosplay is is something that's that's only really in it in its infancy yeah well I mean, like, but they're very proud of what they've accomplished and you know what damn right seeing some of the costumes uh, that they that, that they've made yeah and seeing the passion that, that, that they that they exhibit for it you know, I, I can't get over the, the level of ignorance. Uh, well, that's one of the key differences you know, between, a, people. between a booth babe. A booth babe is someone, in my eyes, who's been hired and they say, here's your, your outfit for the day, etc. Yeah. Or as a cosplayer, is someone who's invested in their own time, yeah. Yeah, making put their the own costumes, coming up with their own ideas, mm -hmm. know, know what they are, know what they're portraying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know there was a whole kickoff about uh, booth babes and stuff like that. In the, the at E3 and stuff like that, and then they went through uh, a phase where they didn't have booth babes. To be honest, I think the whole uh, the whole terminology of booth babes, uh, I I don't think it does justice uh, to those uh, to those individuals either. You know, the, the glamour is is part and parcel of business. You know, it's um, and if somebody has glamour and that's what they trade, you know, and that's what they use to try and capture attention and things like that, mm. that's their business. 
That's their business. It, th these are not people that are trafficked. Mm -hmm. They're not people that are being forced to do this. Yes, it, you know, they're, they're doing what, the, what, what they choose to do. Surely that's an empowering thing. What do you mean? You, know, like, um, you mean like it would be like us saying to someone who's smart, oh my God, don't you be a scientist. <laughs> You, you, That's their natural talent. It's, if, if it's what they're wanting to do. But do you know what? There may or may not be things in the round that, 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 that are worth discussing. And I'm not trying to shoot down the argument. You're entitled to your opinion. But on the Booth Bates side, I'm going to shelve that. You know, that's a different argument. This lady's a cosplayer. And uh, I think that, myself included in this, the level of ignorance as to what cosplay actually is needs to be addressed. And if I can do it, you can do it. And I'll say it again. Cosplay is not about the flesh. It's about the passion, the creativity, the spirit that it goes to do that. The flesh just happens to be part and parcel of how that, that character is portrayed because that's how the character was originally created. So whether you're a man, woman, it doesn't matter. If showing off the, the bits and pieces of flesh is part of the character, then let's whip it out. The flesh. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there, there's there's my thing. I just I just sometimes I, I can't I can't understand the what is almost feels like a level of self righteousness to me in 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 some of the the I, what I'm going to describe as like keyboard warriors um, that will just take offense over stuff that is, it's actually nothing to do with them mm -hmm. you know but they, they'll, they'll take offense on everybody's behalf yeah you know, well, and but but be careful of that because you know some of the comments i've seen that were supposedly defending somebody whoever it was i think were more offensive uh, some of the most offensive things i've ever seen because it just showed the level of mis uh, level of non-understanding not even misunderstanding mm. non-understanding and non taking the time to even try and understand and uh, the borderline arrogance um, i'm not happy about it so i'm looking forward to seeing what what, what goes on there cuz i I've, I've really come around to it and I'm looking forward to actually getting into a bit of cosplay myself. Yep. I'm a big guy. Yep. That kind of limits my options. Not really, because there are a lot of different characters out there that you could play. I... Uh, look at my Nat this year for QCon. She went out as Harley Quinn. Yeah, yeah. I'm hardly going to go out as kind of Harley <laughs> Quinn. No, but you could do from the new Batman, you could go out as Bane. I could go out as Bane. I, yeah, I've got a, a similar build. Yeah, you know, once I you can break your back. <laughs> oh, that's all the way back, man. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. It, it's something I'm, it's yeah. something I'm interested in. But I'm not going to go out and buy a costume. Mm. Um, oh, we have a sewing machine that Andrea has got recently, um, and I'm going to try and see if I can learn to sew mm -hmm. because I think that the only way to truly do cosplay is to have a crack at making your own costume. You could be a cherub. I could be a cherub. <laughs> it's hardly real. Well, I suppose it is a cosplay of sort. I'm, I'm having a look at it. You know, yeah. we, we put out, and um, people put suggestions in one of the previous uh, weekenders yep. um, about it. And I, I've taken it on board, and I, I'm mm -hmm. having a look at it. Bane's a good one, actually, because um, I don't understand anime um, very well. So yes, there's but no you, point you in love your, your superhero. I do love stuff. my superheroes, okay? Um, I would go as the Hulk, but I think I'd look, make a stupid you would look. You would Hulk. probably have to shave your head and do the Homer Simpson oh, Hulk. Or yeah. you, or you, <laughs> Homer mad! Homer's mad! Get revenge on world! Or you could just do Homer, yeah. I could do Homer, yeah. yeah. I, well, could, I could go as Homer. Uh, for next year's QCOM, myself and that have discussed it. We're actually going to do a, a video game cosplay. So, yeah. you know Borderlands 2? No. From 2K Games. It's... Uh, it's a really weird one, but yes. Nat's going to go as Moxie and I'm going as Handsome Jack, uh -huh. which should be interesting. I'll bring up a couple of images on screen so everyone can see the two characters. Yeah, including me, please. <laughs> so it's when I watch this back, I can, I can see what the hell you're talking about. It, yeah, it sounds good to me. It sounds good to me. Um, so anyway, that, that's, my, that's my own personal thoughts mm. on cosplay. You may agree, you may not agree. That's what the world's about. But right. you know, at least take the time. To, to look into what you're going to complain about. Right, now the challenge, how are you segueing back from that to gaming? So, okay, for a long time I've been complaining mm -hmm. that uh, Foreground haven't been doing fantasy terrain. Right. That has now changed. 
Okay. <laughs> so, well, I'm going from complaining, right? <laughs> not to complaining. complaining to complaining. Foreground okay. have just released uh, what is going to be one of the most beautiful fantasy sets, um, I think, on the market. Now, everybody, if you haven't seen Foreground, you have got to check these guys out. They do uh, HDF laser cut terrain, uh, but their stuff comes pre colored. Okay, they have been investing incredible amounts of research and development into um, how they cut things, how mm -hmm. they color things, how to get the color to interact with the lasers, and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Justin, it's all about uh, the lasers. Uh, oh, oh, uh, am I having to do this now? <laughs> Mr. Powers, lasers. Lasers. Yes. Well, well, if you want to see more of the foreground stuff, you can watch. I think it's episode, it's either episode, it's, I think it's episode one of the salute. It's yep. episode two. Yep. Was it of, episode, uh, episode two? two of our salute coverage and episode three will be coming out shortly now um, to uh, remind you guys of all of that. And we've got some more salute coverage from the previous show coming up. We're hoping to show you some nice galleries of images and things. Mm -hmm. But these guys have now went into, the, they're now releasing this long awaited uh, fantasy tour. This is the kit we were looking at, at salute. Um, yeah, to let you guys have a look at it, this is it. I'll describe it. So, yeah. yep. scroll up, keep scrolling, do you see it? Um, so this stuff here looks to me like it's just come straight out of fable. How beautiful is yeah. this? Now the beauty of it is, what you see is what you're going to get. You don't have to paint this stuff. Mm -hmm. You just put it together and it's going to look like that. And it, I just look at it and go, oh, I enjoy, I enjoy that look, that fantasy look where they take what were, you know, Tudor type buildings and stuff, but they give them that... Um, what, they start the, cartoonizing them very, very slightly. It's yeah. like the crooked house kind of thing, isn't it? Mm. Where they, uh, they, they slightly, they slightly warp the shapes and stuff like that. Mm. There, I just think it's it's absolutely fabulous. Yeah, the, the absolute. They did a fantastic uh, sort of little port town with this stuff, mm -hmm. didn't they? And it looked. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to take it home with me. Well, what I'm hoping to do actually is to uh, try some of this on our harbour table. Oh. Uh, so I'd like to get some of this stuff and actually lay it out work, yeah. on the harbour table that we built for uh, for Volsung, yeah. um, and see uh, what it looks like and try and uh, see if we can do something kind of Mordheimy maybe. That would be kind of cool. I don't think I ever played Mordheim. Now is your know chance, if, big I don't know boy. if the dry dock bit's going to work with that, but. You know, it could work with it, I suppose. Well, we can come up with a way to we've got do, brass to pipes and things in that, and I just... Mm. Are they all glued in, are they? Yeah, they are, but we could put a new base on the top of it and just set it in. Yeah. Yeah, you could just get a lid for the dry dock and turn it into another part of the town. Just have a raised section. do that. Yeah. Yep. And just dock some on the side, yeah. Or we could build some kind of like a castle type thing that actually sits on top of it. Yeah, so, so you have a lid for your dry oh, dock. Oh, yeah, so you've got castle and little town outside. Yeah. yeah. So you have your, yeah. Do you castle, foreground do castle a castle wall. yet? Um, no. Okay. No. Get to work. Uh, we, yeah, get to work, guys. Uh, we, we'd, like to, we'd like to see it. Foreground, foreground making a castle. castle. Mm. So um, it's always nice to brainstorm live on the show. <laughs> but um, I, I just cannot wait to try this stuff. I just mm. think it's, it, it's so, so sweet. Quirky, that's the word I was looking for. Quirky. Quirky looking. Quirky is a really good way of describing it. So, if you're into your fantasy stuff, this stuff I think is perfect for uh, wargaming. So if you're your Kings of War tables and for your Warhammer fantasy tables. Um, however, I think role players will love this stuff laid out on a table and uh, playing in and around it. Um, and definitely anybody that's into their skirmish games, I think our Ben probably wet his pants when he saw this mm -hmm. stuff because Ben is a huge player of Mordheim. Mm -hmm. And whenever I mention Mordheim, yes. that's how we're going to learn Mordheim. Okay. We're going to get Ben over here. The other one I would grab that for, this. do a port town for War Machine. Or the Iron Kingdoms oh, RPG. Oh, it would be perfect for War Machine, wouldn't yeah. it? Or the Iron Kingdoms RPG. Yeah. Because it's very combat heavy, so you, scenery like that would be perfect for it. So you're fighting in and around yeah. it. Yeah. The, the other thing is, uh, Foreground also have a terribly bad, shocking habit of detailing the insides of their models. So what I'm interested to find out is whether they've done that on these. And I suspect mm -hmm. that they probably have. Um, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? We'll, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, a massive kudos goes out to Foreground for that. Um, brilliant work. Can't wait to see it. Okay.
Uh, we're going to take a quick break. After the break, I'm going to sit down with Ronnie Renton to talk about Mantic. Um, so enjoy that. After the interview, we'll be right back because there's a couple of things going on in the world that you want to know about because you might want to get involved. Uh, we will see you in a little while. So I have Ronnie with me. Um, Ronnie. Yes, sir. How's things going over at Mantic Towers? Well, it's nice being back here. I mean, James bulldozed his way in, didn't he? And I couldn't get a look in for about a year. Yep, that's which, true. Which that's is very true. nice. He does some lovely stuff, but I never get to come out and talk. So, uh, busy. We've had a kind of manic 15 months. It was just crazy. Uh, I think from the from the Dead Zone Kickstarter, our feet didn't touch the ground. Just mm -hmm. getting things made, done. We moved last month. And then since then, we've at least just had a little bit of time just to draw breath, kind of recharge ourselves. Um, and now we're almost ready for the next phase. And I think it's just starting to come yeah. over the next coming months. So, so let, let's kind of recap on where you've been, because it's been whirlwind. You, know, yep. you've, you had um, Kings of War, yep. you've had Warpath, you've had the Dwarf King's Hold, you've had uh, Dreadball, you've had Dead Zone. You've had Mars Attacks. Uh, you're just about to go back out with another big Kickstarter, yep. uh, looking at the dungeon crawlers, and we'll have more on that. Yep. Um, we're back soon. into the Dwarf King's Hole, actually. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, no, nothing new now. We're just kind of going back and doing everything better and, yeah. and deeper and more properly. I mean, we've done... I think Kings of War's in a really great place. It's a lovely book. I think we're going to dip back in with a uh, softback book, mm -hmm. which will just get all the errata and all the Q&A and update all the army lists but no new rules. It's mm -hmm. going to be the same rule set, but your portable version instead of your hardback. Yeah. With with because we've released a lot of army lists, something like that will come out soon. That will keep that fresh for another couple of years. But it's really growing around the world. People love the cleanness, the speed of it. Mm -hmm. and there's a nice range there. Uh, Warpath is something we're going to come to, but you know we've really got to feel that we're there with it. Well, What's happening in the meantime? You, yeah. You're, I have, in, in among all this, I have questions from the community. Okay. Um, because I, I pinged them quietly before you came on nice. air just yeah, to say, okay. ah, we have him. Um, so send through your questions. So uh, don't worry, I will ambush you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything less. I'm not going to get it. Um, someone's asking about the, the next Kickstarter. So okay. I want to just have a quick chat about that. So the next Kickstarter is due for kind of what august yep, is it august time and we're going to be looking at these fellas here which is the it's going to be going back to the dwarf king's old series which was mm -hmm. the dungeon crawler um at the time it was a way we were able to make more use out of the plastics we had yeah. and got it into new people's hands now of course we're able to come back and look at it absolutely fresh so you're going to have a party of adventurers that may well have a barbarian, a dwarf fighter, a wizard, and a... Uh, Elf. <laughs> Doing the classics, assembled coloured plastic so you can just get out and play. Yeah. Really nice tiles, nice thick card, scenario-driven game, and then as you play through all of that, you can then take it on and into deeper, darker adventures. I've recorded with Ronnie a special on this, just looking deeply uh, in at this particular thing. So look forward to that. I got to say, it's very, very exciting. Yeah. Um, next question: Any new franchise link-ups? Obviously, Mars Attacks has went very well. Yeah. Key stat on Mars Attacks is it's your biggest selling game to date outside of Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. It, well, it's... including I mean, including Kickstarter, in the total number of games printed, um, it already has printed the same number as Dread Ball and Dead Zone. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is Dead Zone's done that in two prints. Mm -hmm. Dreadball's done it in five prints. Yeah. So we're on our fifth and sixth printing of Dreadball. Mm -hmm. This has done it in one print. <laughs> it's going to be in German, French, and Spanish at launch as well as English. Yeah. And already the pre order book on it means we've got, it's currently the 30th of June. It's not coming out for a couple of months. And we've got less than a thousand of the first print one mm -hmm. left, which is the biggest print we've ever done. So when those last thousand have gone, which I suspect will be in about a week to 10 days, yeah. we'll be on a second print run before the game is launched. Now, at this stage, a lot of you guys are probably still waiting to, to see your Mars Attack stuff. Having seen it, though, you guys have nailed it. Yeah. What a really good game. Uh, you clearly, 
you know your way about now in in terms yeah. of a franchise. Yeah. You, know, um, you can demonstrate that you've you, that you've been able to. Well, that, that that's the big thing. It. I mean, we talk something, and Mars Attacks has a lot of resonance to the US. You know, this was their first car. It was one of the first sci-fi products ever made. Mm -hmm. You know, it came out in fifties. Obviously, my first reference point was the movie. Yep. which they have ambivalent feelings about. They don't mm -hmm. feel it really reflects their cards and their heritage. So we have to kind of unpick that, understand mm -hmm. it, and then produce something that we think they'd be pleased with and we'd be pleased with. I think Jake, the sculptors, one sculptor that sculpted it all, a couple of sculptors, but not very many, mm -hmm. all sculpted at the same time, all painted at the same time. Yeah. Everything has a really unified feel, mm -hmm. and because it's a, 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 a starter game, you you take the contents out of the game. The, the soldiers are coloured. You know which side you're on. The clip, the minute the scenery is clipped together, we've been mm -hmm. able to refine that, and you've, within five minutes you're playing a war game. Yeah, which I think is just brilliant. It's just exciting and galvanising, and um, so we're very pumped about it. So that's going to be shipping out to Kickstarters August. Mm -hmm. Want to have some demo sets at Gen Con to show to people. Um, and then we'll be shipping out to retail in September. So if you could, uh, if you could pick a franchise, yep. what would it be, and what style of game you, would you roll it out as? Well, I think there'd be two. I think there's two. There's two areas we'd look at. One would be taking a really big license and trying to do a war game with it. Yeah. So pick something that's known for for war games. The challenge with that is, of course, getting people to critical mass and yes. having lots of soldiers and lots of tanks. And the trend at the moment is to kind of simplify things down and, and get started at a relatively low level. Mm -hmm. All the others would be some of these more, you know, TV-orientated series. That mm -hmm. There's a whole selection of them around at the moment that are more map-based, yeah. uh, scenario-driven, where we can actually put the whole lot in the game. You can take it out and you can play it. So it's not a board game. Mm -hmm. You know, some board games have a couple of miniatures in them. No, it... It's a miniatures game. It's the miniatures are the key things. What's going on, on the tabletop is the main point, mm -hmm. but it, it's without the whole stress of a um, of having to paint and glue and assemble hundreds of models, yeah. which we know is one of the kind of bounce off points for a for a war game. Mm -hmm. So, what would be your franchise? <laughs> I'm, I'm taking the fifth on I'm, this I'm one. going to have to do a Paxman on yeah, this. I, yeah. I'm I sorry, Ronnie, but you haven't answered the, the question. question. So, <laughs> I can tell you I'm going to America uh, in August and again in September or October. I'm, I'm going to be visiting LA in New York and we're yeah. going to be having some discussions with people. But okay. at the moment, there is. And let's be honest, Mars Attacks has not hit the shelves yet. Yeah. We've got the pre-orders in, mm -hmm. but if I'm going back to those guys in November saying, Ronnie, you know, what's happened here? It's not yeah. sold, then I'll have to rethink. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sure that's not going to be the case, but it hasn't, you know, we're so far over these Kickstarters, it funds yeah. the tooling. We've got to get that out. We've yeah. got to make sure that people are excited about it and, it, and it's got to perform. Have you um, considered producing anything uh, what they would what they have called here in this question like epic scale at like six mil or 10 mil or 15 mil uh, what what would be like a, an epic scale of warpath well actually I want to do warpath 3.0 as epic so I want it to be 28 mil but with the tanks the the, the huge things that I, I want to make an epic scale game in 28, 28 mil. mil, correct. And that's why you do simple plastics, really quick rules, play on a six by four, mm. but really make it work with unit versus unit gaming. Yeah. Like Kings of War just scales up beautifully. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we, hey, we've got a lovely skirmish game with Dead Zone. The mm -hmm. universe is building out really beautifully. Yeah. All the races are getting character. There's a novel, there's a book. And remind us we should do some giveaway there so mm -hmm. everyone can have a chapter because it's really well written and really nicely done. But I think for us to make a, something that's interesting and kind of, you know, mantic and a bit frantic, a bit crazy, is to look at a, waking, a game that really allows you to build 400 figure armies. Not because right. you have to, but because you want to. It'll yeah. work with with five or six units, it'll play very nicely, but actually, and it'll play in an hour, but actually if you want to play for four or five hours, how about if you, you multiply the force by... Mm -hmm. So hours. this is where you're starting to shine your focus on Warpath then, yeah. is much, much larger scale game. It, it starts so. here and goes up, and we've got yeah. some ways of actually being quite slick, I think, about making a, a, a squad-based skirmish game, yeah. you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll put that out later, but, if you don't, if you build something, if you go with every single model is every single model. Yes. What weapon he has is key. Mm -hmm. You can't scale up. 
Because yeah. when you've got 60 figures or more, every single turn you have to go, he fires mm -hmm. at him. Even if there's seven fire, every weapon is relevant. Whereas actually, if you're going to make a war game, a sci fi war game, how do you have colossuses and huge Forge mm -hmm. Father tanks coming across the battle with 17 guns and blowing bits of it off? You've got to be able to kind of move quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And so we're challenging it. We're not there yet. We're going to have a nice scale. It'll start here, but there'll be nothing that means it doesn't work here as well. Yeah. So it's not either or, but wouldn't it be great that when you've got your first, you've got your dead zone figures, you can squad, you can put those into a squad and start playing. You think, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I just need to add a, a little bit of this and a, and a flyer and a, okay, that's now a little war game mm -hmm. army. I'll add a couple more flyers and a this. Okay, now it's starting to go into quite an interesting one, and oh, oh you know, well, that's the journey. Right? That's yeah. a lovely long journey where you can keep indulging your army and building it up a bit and getting it bigger. And I think that would be exciting if we can start there, you know, leave no one behind, but where it ends, it's yeah. a big universe, and they're going to have big armies, and you want big battles. There, there must be something in the water over in Nottingham, because <laughs> there seems to be something uh, very much with, the, with yourself and John Stallard as well. You know, you say to John Stallard about 15 million, you go, 15 what? <laughs> <laughs> There's one true war game he's scared. You do a big game at 28 yeah. million. Yeah. <laughs> so why Simple wait? That. Except exactly, yes. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, I must admit, I'm looking forward to that. Um, so a lot of people are asking about Kickstarter and, and is Kickstarter still important oh. to Mantic? You know, um, and I, I think I think part of this comes from you know a little bit of naivety in the in the general community as to um, what our industry is actually like and how big our industry truly is yeah. in, in scale yeah. compared to other industries. Um, but do you want to put it into perspective for folks? But I mean. If we look big, hey, we're not as big as, as we look. We've always been a, a dog with a bar, large bar, bar bark. But let me, I'll, give you, I'll give you two great examples mm -hmm. straight away. But Mars Attacks is coming out next. I could have funded the Martians and the humans. We could have written it. Um, and that would have been as far as I could have taken it until it was then commercially successful. Yeah. Um, I couldn't then have put on you know, some of the more stuff. If I hadn't done that, I'm not sure the French, the Germans and the Spanish would have bought in. Yes. But because of the Kickstarter funding that comes in a year early, that cash comes in and I can spend that mm -hmm. on not just making the scenery, I can make also the accessories. Yes. I can make the science division. I can make the flying saucer. Yeah. I can make the truck. Mm -hmm. I can make the robot. Yeah. Because I can commit to that, I can get the best people working on it, I can get it made and tooled and done. When it hits the retail launch, it's now a three times as big game as it would have been. Yes. Yeah. Those that have been out of pocket for a year mm -hmm. <laughs> get a few extra goodies and freebies. Yeah. Those that are investing at the retail point, A, there's plenty of discounts out there that people can get and go to the local hobby club. They can test it, they can play it, they can mm -hmm. pick which faction they're going to get, and they're able to invest in a game that is now three, four, five times as popular yeah. and as, as supported as it would be if I had to do it piece mm -hmm. at a time. It's one of those things we'll have to we see how it pans out, but but realistically, you know, it's it, Kickstarter is giving more support up front yep. to a game, yep. more belief yep. in a game, a bigger product range from launch, Hugely. which uh, massively increases the 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 amount that retailers can then sell on. Yeah, and the cost is well, ultimately, the cost is a small proportion of a marketplace that wasn't actually there in the first place. Well, and that's so. the, well, this is the interesting thing because it's a commercial success that spread. So, you know, I was doing a couple of thousand copies of games when we were pre-Kickstarter. I have sold five times as many Dreadball mm -hmm. through retailers, local stockists, my own website and game stores mm -hmm. than I did on Kickstarter. Yeah. So I mean, you can do the math. Two and a half thousand on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Just 18 months later, Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're just about to print, you know, 12 to the 15,000 mark. Yeah. So another two and a half thousand are coming in. Mm -hmm. Five times as many, four times as many have gone through the local gamers, game stores yeah. because they're now backing into a game that has three seasons, mm -hmm. 12 plastic teams. I was going to do two teams in metal of yeah. the first four mm -hmm. because my launch quantities were not yeah. sufficient to justify plastic. So Kickstarter, particularly the way we're using it, we are you taking that money and putting it in a game 
doing the games we wanted to do. Yeah. Because we believe that then working with the retailers afterwards means we'll see, you know, a return that we can then put into mm -hmm. the next game. Yeah. And so it's absolute, you know, kind of essential. It's an absolute lifeblood for a small company like ours to be able to go out, share our vision and get a few people to come in early, support mm -hmm. it. Yes, they get more. Yes, they might not buy that at their local gaming store, but 80, 80 for every 20 we get, the other yes. 80 will. Yeah. For every and two the and a half thousand. is if they didn't come in and support it, 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 wouldn't, it, may, it wouldn't even be there in the first well, place. Oh, we wouldn't get yeah. noticed. And Mars Attacks would not now be doing 12,000 on an initial print run, mm -hmm. going into Germany, France, Spain, <coughs> um, already pre-sold out on the first, yeah. on the first launch. <coughs> the video's out there. So everything is better because of it. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it does work, it, particularly in our industry where the upfront costs of a game are very, very high. Mm -hmm. So for us, no, it, it really is essential and people think we could do without it and we're a big company. Not at all. This, mm -hmm. this money is essential for us to realise the vision of what we'd like to make. Right, last question for you. Okay. Um, Warpath 3.0. Yep. The rumblings are starting to build. Now that you've just told everybody that every game is going to be apocalyptic in nature. No, just that one. Just that one. <laughs> Can we start to nail you down to a time yeah, frame? When well, are we likely to see it? I mean, it was always the, the view that Dead Zone was a stepping stone into the Warpath universe. Mm. We were clear when we first did Warpath, there is a want to do a new sci-fi game, but we weren't ready at the time to do it. Yeah. It was too ambitious for us. So we had to you know, step back and we did Dreadball and then we did it right. Mm -hmm. Did every single team right? The figures are right. The rules are right. The art was there, and it grew, and that allowed us to go back in and with Dead Zone, you know, wow, what, you know, when that Kickstarter went, and not only did it fund out the the basic six factions, and we didn't do all of them. We purposely limited ourselves to relatively small numbers of soldiers, mm -hmm. but it also gave us the book, the background, the novels. Yeah. So the universe started to live. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people now who've got a corporation army or they're looking mm -hmm. at the Forge Fathers or the Asterians and the Asterians are, are their own race and this background. It gave us the buildings. Yeah. It also gave us four, so the zombies are here, they've got the hard plastic zombies, we've got the Strider. So already each and every army has got a few of the key units mm -hmm. started to go into place. Yeah. So from day one we don't need to fund every single unit, for every single army, for every single race. Mm -hmm. um, so that builds up. I think the Kickstarter two second wave for Dead Zone is coming out. Mm -hmm. That's going to give a load more enforcers in hard plastic, blah, blah, blah. And I'm hoping that once that's arrived and people are going to play with it, mm -hmm. I'm able to send out a Warpath 3.0 beta. Right. So we can say you've got the models. Mm -hmm. Have a play with this. Tell us what you think. Yeah. So it'll be a beta out of those backers, out of the people that are interested, to have a go, have a play, with a view that if we can therefore build a momentum up towards the end of this year, it would be lovely. Mm -hmm. If not, maybe we do a Dead Zone 2 or 1.5, do something like the Vermin, get mm -hmm. them in plastic, and give ourselves a bit more time to develop yeah. the core rules until we feel that we're really creating something that people want and we're able to achieve it. Yeah. And even if it's not the biggest Kickstarter, that's not important. What's important is if we want to get four races funded, I think you need vehicles. Mm -hmm. We've got which each army has got. So <clears throat> the enforcers, they're a hard hitting force. They don't have vehicles, they don't have tanks. Yeah. Because they land, they've got jetpacks, and they're on you. Mm -hmm. But if you can hold them off, ultimately your heavy stuff's going to win. Or, you know, yeah. each army's really going to fight with a really interesting uh, dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, when we've created that, We'll go out and we'll say, okay, look, help us fund these first four armies or two Fantastic. armies. Fantastic. Well, guys, we'll leave it at that. Um, for you backstagers, I will be probing his mind about this beta test for Warpath 3.0, so we might be able to squeeze something out <laughs> for you guys on that. Ronnie, look, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, big thanks to Ronnie and Mantic. Hope you enjoyed that. If you have any questions that you'd like us to put to Ronnie, why not post them in the comments below? And after the show, we'll, we'll go and grab them and we'll see if we can get some answers for you. So there you have it. That's what Mantic um, are, are getting up to. And that was an interesting conversation with him about f uh, Kickstarter, actually, mm -hmm. because it's um, there is 
it, it's worth realizing, guys, that within the within the wargaming industry, we're such a small industry. We're so niche that big companies are small companies. Big companies are small mm -hmm. companies, and you know there there's not an awful lot of resource that goes around. You know, and we, we look at things like um, you know Kickstarter's raising. You know, seven hundred thousand mm. dollars, okay, or even in some instances, some of the cool mini or not stuff uh, raising maybe a couple of million dollars. Mm -hmm. But let, let's try and put this into perspective, okay? They have to fund the sculpting, the development, mm -hmm. okay, of all of the product. That comes out of that. Yep. They then have to fund the manufacture of all of that. Yep. And the shipping of all of that, yes, if the shipping component has been included in it or added on or whatever. Not only that, as they hit their stretch goals, they have new miniatures that come into it, new scenery or whatever. Yeah. That all comes out of that too. Yeah. So what you'll but, often find... But they have to manage it as well. Uh, they yeah. have to manage it all as well. And they have to hire the people to be able to process it and stuff. Yep. So what you find is that the, the Mantic, as a prime example, as we discussed in the video, Every, every penny, probably plus a bit, mm -hmm. from the Kickstarter goes into covering the investment of that range, mm -hmm. okay? And they only start to actually make their money on it whenever it goes through retail. Yeah. And one of the interesting things was, you know, that a lot of us have been wondering how much damage, if any, has Kickstarter actually done to retail, mm -hmm. okay? Now this is a conversation that, that that is that is a lot deeper than it seems on the surface, okay? Because retailers have a lot to be concerned about these days, and I want to see um, our good retailers, the ones that are putting the effort in and the passion in to do the job right. We want to see those guys succeed, you know. So um, support your local retailer guys if they're worth supporting. Get behind them, okay? Um, if they're not. Well, you know they're not worth the they're not worth the effort. But it was interesting to see that you know for every item that was sold via Kickstarter, mm -hmm. Mantic would estimate at the worst, you know, maybe five would go through retail. Okay, yeah. so for uh, every twenty pounds, for every hundred pounds spent, twenty pounds was spent at the Kickstarter. Eighty eighty pounds is spent through uh, yeah the you know, stores after it. independent retailers and things like that. You'd obviously like to see that grow, but that can only grow um, with uh, with us doing more support via the retailers. Mm. The but it's obviously not just a black and white story. Just because that's the case for Mantic doesn't mean that's the case for other people who've come off Kickstarters. Mm. No, no. So you know, so we can only you, we can only surmise. You know, and then you have companies like Battlefront who are doing who did their best to actually build a retailer component. Yeah, into, in, into the Kickstarter. But I'll, I'll oversimplify here. I, I look at it, and sometimes I look at it and think, it's just a pre-order system. And then other times I look at it and I'll go, well, it, it does help retailers because if there wasn't Kickstarters to make new products, retailers wouldn't have products to sell. Yes. That's me oversimplifying a bit. It is a little bit. You're absolutely right in one sense. The only problem is for our independent stores... There's too much now. There's too much choice. The ranges are too big. Kickstarter's success has taken it that it's not it's not often now just a core product. It's a core product and a whole bunch of expansions. Mm -hmm. And most independent retailers are in this category. They would be best served by lots of passing traffic because the products are interesting. They could dress the windows. Uh, do the merchandising and passing traffic come in and hopefully sell on to it. However, it's very difficult to afford that because the rates and the rents in areas where there is high levels of passing traffic astronomical. are astronomical. Yeah, they would cripple you. Hmm. And an independent retailer these days can't really operate in a small store. Because the number of ranges that actually do sell quite well and the number of SKUs, SKUs, or products within those ranges... 
I'm, I'm sorry, I'm stopping myself from yawning. It's been a long day. I'm, I'm going to slap you. <laughs> it, it, it's not the content of what you're on about. But the number of products within those ranges means that they, they can't... They, what, how would they know what to stock on any given day, mm -hmm. right? On top what, of that, they need look, to find... They need to find... Well, yeah, you, you look, look at this, right? Yeah. And there's only really one box of... Each. You know, yeah. max, there's maybe three boxes of the same range or something sitting here. Yeah. And look at the size of it. Yeah. And that's, you've only gotten a tiny fraction of each little range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Couple that with the fact that any modern independent retailer now needs to consider gaming space. What he wants is people that are coming in and gaming regularly. Um, and because people that come in and game will then spend money and, mm -hmm. and do everything else. They want to be providing food because food is a high margin item, et cetera. So there's a lot of pressure being put on these guys. They need a big space. Yep. Ideally, they want it somewhere where there's passing, passing footfall, but they're not gonna be able to afford that, the mm -hmm. vast majority of them. So they end up finding a big space that's further out. In some cases, it's so bloody far out that people can't be arsed traveling to it. Yep, at which point you're relying on building a community of gamers who bring their mates continuously. Yep, which is no easy thing to do. So, so these Kickstarters are putting pressure on them. They're creating great products for them to sell. However, there needs to be, uh, there needs to be, I'm I think we as a community need <laughs> to take responsibility in trying to work with our, with our independent retailers and in basically saying to them, I would like to get this stuff from the Kickstarter and we need to cut them the slack to say, Go ahead and order that in. Hmm. I will wait. Because the temptation is always to go uh, online where basically the, the, the economy of scale is, is very different because hmm. they have they basically just have a warehouse and a packing team. Yep. And you go online and you, you buy it there. It's very convenient. It has a you lot of great things. Go. Click, I'm, I want that. Click, I'm I want all that. for Click online that. because you know uh, online, I think, has given us what, I, what we call the last mile, reaching people who don't have independent stores. Mm. But if you're lucky enough to have an independent store, work with them. Talk with them. How, is, how can you make sure that they stay there? Mm. Because believe me, if they don't, what's the option? Perhaps clubs. Perhaps I, clubs. I tend not to buy stuff online anyway. Because even though probably our best gaming stores and stuff are up in Belfast, it's quite a mm. jaunt from here. It gives me something to do on a day out. Mm -hmm. Because for me, the, there, there's a serious lack of what I call man shops. Yes. Up the, up, the, up the street. There's plenty of clothing shops and shoe shops and all sorts mm -hmm. of stuff. And, you know, I can walk around with my other half and she'll have all these shops to go in and I'll be sitting there complaining. There's no man shops. <laughs> yeah. HMV is closed in the town. Yep. That, this other shop I used to go to in the town is closed. So I like to go into model shops and not buy online because it's just, I like the experience of going in and picking up the stuff and going. You, you also get that, that lovely this little is, this impulse is cool. buy. I'm going to take this now. This is my little retail yeah. treat for the mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. Well, there you have it. it it's, it's an interesting one. We are in a position where ultimately the, the fate of this industry rests in our hands as the people that, that, that buy it. We need to, I think, start to, th to show some responsibility in how we, want to, how we want to do that. You know, we want to support our manufacturers whenever they're going to invest in a new product. Kickstarter now seems to be the obvious way to do that. But at the same time, we also want to support our preferred methods of retail and for many of us, we want to try and keep our independent stores uh, alive and kicking the same way as we want to keep the, the high quality um, internet stores that are doing their best to do the last mile to get the, co the hobby out to those people that don't mm -hmm. have um, independent stores. It's balance now, there, it is about balance. It's about having a balance of all of it. Mm -hmm. I don't think any one um, aspect deserves uh, to be the dominant. So all things uh, in moderation. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, some cool stuff you can get involved in. Okay, first up, Gates of Antares, Rick Priestley's sci-fi game um, that had a little bit of a stuttering start on Kickstarter, mm -hmm. more so to do with their inexperience of how Kickstarter actually works yep. uh, than to do with the game itself. But the game is now going out for playtest and you can get involved in it. Um, it's a fascinating game with a fascinating background, and it, it, it for me, um, 
I'm really, really looking forward to seeing this game develop because Priestley has such uh, an imagination for the mm -hmm. for the science fiction, and I'm just looking forward to seeing what he, what what he comes up with. So, if you're interested in trying that out, head on over to Warlord Games. Uh, where you can get involved in the play test. I'm really excited to see Warlord coming out with some sci-fi stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, awesome. It is going to be cool. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, the other really awesome thing that's going on is Winged Hussar, um, a great uh, indie publisher in the states, um, run by one of the people that used to be um, high up in Black Library. Right. Uh, one of the the most fantastic men on the planet, a guy called Vince. Um, absolute gentleman and a rock star in the industry among uh, all the people in the know in the industry. He runs a company called Winged Hussar. They're a publisher. They publish the Wild West Exodus novels. We've been given one away recently. Uh, and if we haven't, we will be in the next day or two. Mm -hmm. um, a sample chapter um, uh, to our backstagers. But he's running a Wild West Exodus short story competition. So if you've ever fancied writing a short story, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere between seven and 10,000 words, and uh, you know, hopefully having it published, well, now's your chance. You um, basically write a short story, 10, seven to 10,000 words, based in the Wild West Exodus universe. Mm -hmm. um, the judging will be between the July the 5th and August the 5th, or at least that's, I think that's when the submissions can go in. Mm -hmm. And it will be published in an upcoming Wild West Exodus anthology. Ooh, very cool. So you could be a published author. July the 5th? Mm-hmm. You need to get writing, man. Yes, yeah. between you, the submissions are between July the 5th and August 5th, so you have a month. Oh. Um, right, but you could knock out 10,000 words in a weekend. You could knock out 10,000 brilliant words in about two weeks. So, mm. so in other words, get cracking. Yeah, absolutely. So, anyway, finally the competition. We are, as we said at the start of the video, giving away the Azure Primal Bowl 8 Limited Edition. It's an enormous package. If you want to win it, you got to be in it. So, post a comment on either or all of these three places. Over at beastsofwar.com, create yourself one of the free accounts and post a comment there. On Here on YouTube, just yep. post a comment below, or you'll see a post on Facebook about this video. If you post on Facebook, you're entered as well. We will pick one winner at random and you will win that amazing limited edition yep. mountain of stuff. Dreadball's a fantastic game. If you've never seen it played, check out the Dreadball Academy. You've, you've given it away whose voice that is now. <laughs> it was me! <laughs> it was me! Yeah, go and check it out. Other than that, look guys, thank you so much for watching. Tomorrow morning we will be back with the XLBS. That's the extra long backstage version of The Weekender. We're going to be talking in detail about this table, specifically about our experiments of creating a table for dust tactics, dust warfare, all on the same table. Um, Lloyd has been doing some dust. I've been doing some cactuses. Yeah, I'm going to be talking a bit about that. And we're giving away a cool War Machine product mm -hmm. to uh, one lucky backstager. It's Servath Resnick. Yes, Ooh. the Wrath of Ages. So, um, if you fancy coming over and joining that, we have a seven day free trial for backstage, which means you can come and watch that and try out some of the other stuff we have for seven days. Um, and if you cancel before the seven days, well, we promise to give you back all the money that you didn't spend. <laughs> I'll laugh if somebody figures out a way to screw you over. <laughs> so um, come on, uh, come on over and try that out. Guys, as always, look, thank you so much for sitting and listening to the three of us bullshit about all things gaming. Um, it's always lovely to spend a Saturday morning with you. We, we appreciate you taking the time to, to watch. Comment below. Let us know what your thoughts are on all that mountain of stuff. And more importantly than all of it, have a great week's gaming. See you soon, guys.